I'm ready to rock and roll. How about you? Well, yeah. <laughs> I know. That's how I feel, too. <laughs> oh, my word. Uh, well, let's have a word of prayer together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you very much. We're so thankful that you love us. We got the better end of that deal by far. Thank you for your mercy, for your goodness, for your kindness, for the health and strength you give us day by day, and for all the blessings that we enjoy. Now, Lord, we ask your favor and blessing as we study your word tonight. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Well, I, I do have to say I'm on the eve of my 70th birthday. Tomorrow I'll be 70 years old. I never imagined I would be so old as this. But lo and behold, here I am, and uh, it's amazing. I don't feel like I'm a day over 90, I tell you that, that's for sure. Okay, well, I'm kind of excited to be studying the Word of God tonight, and particularly here in chapter 4 now uh, of the book of Revelation. We uh, started our series in Revelation, and it was the messages to seven particular churches in what is today Western Turkey that uh, God gave the message through the Apostle John, and it was to go to uh, those seven churches. Then in chapter 4, he turns the corner, and it's no longer just to those seven churches, but it is rather a message about what is going to take place. John sees uh, an open door in heaven, and he's able to look through that door and see all kinds of things there. And so that's what this picture that I found on the internet represents. Uh, but in, in looking at these chapters, chapters 4 and 5 are distinctly different from the other chapters that are to follow. And so I began to ask myself the question, what's the, the big picture point of these two chapters that we're going to be studying next, chapters 4 and chapter 5? And, uh, and, and why are they so different from the others? And I saw essentially, in my opinion, this is kind of the theory that I'm putting forward here tonight uh, for you to think about, and that is that these chapters represent prototypes. I'm not entirely satisfied with my word prototypes. Maybe the better word would be paradigm. Uh, the, the thesaurus didn't help me, but they are somehow illustrations of very important ideas. And that's why I call them prototypes. They are really emblematic of the entire book. They represent the entire book and what's taking place there. And so um, these three uh, paradigms or these three prototypes have to do, I think, with the rule of God, with the worship of God, and with the protection that God provides. Those, I think, are the three prototypes that we're going to be dealing with in this uh, chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. So again, we've had the message to the seven churches, and now here in chapter 4 it begins uh, like this. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. So there's clearly teenagers in heaven. As my father always said, were you born in a barn? Close the door. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's probably not a good description here. Anyway, and the voice I had first heard, meaning back in the chapter 1, speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So I underlined uh, the words, uh, take place after this. I think that tells us that what we're describing here is beyond the message to the churches, and maybe it's chronological. That is, uh, it's going to happen yet in the future. And I think, generally speaking, the book of Revelation, uh, from this point on, is about things that are going to happen uh, in the future. But the ideas that I'm highlighting here and kind of my models or prototypes or paradigms or whatever the best word is that maybe it'll come to me eventually, but uh, are three in number. The throne in heaven that we're going to see represents or is a prototype of God's rule over all the earth. 
And that is essentially the story of the book of Revelation, how the rule of God comes to be established or over all the earth. And then the second prototype is the temple in heaven and its worship as the model for the worship of God's people from the earth. That is how God's work, God is worshipped in heaven is how he is to be worshipped on the earth and how he will be ultimately worshipped on the earth. And then the one that's probably the least um, a, a prototype, but still I put it in that category, is having to do with the cherubim that are shown in this chapter. And I'm calling them the guardians of God's presence, which you've heard me say that before. Uh, but they are also the guardians, the guardian angels on this earth whenever trouble develops. And I'm going to put forward the idea that we are all protected by guardian angels, which Jesus said, because God's spirit is within us. So in the same way that the cherubim in heaven uh, guard are the guardian angels of the presence of God, that in our lives, they are also the guardian angels. We know we have guardian angels. What we don't know from the scripture is what is the nature of those angels. Because there are many different kinds of angels mentioned in the scripture. But the cherubim are always the guardians of the presence of God. And so I'm proposing the notion, and what's prototypical about this, is that the cherubim are our guardian angels as well because the Spirit of God dwells within us. And of course, this is important because when you really go from chapters 6 and beyond, it's all about the trouble that comes upon the earth as God increasingly projects His rule onto the earth and deals with larger and larger numbers of the rebels. And kind of the ultimate dealing with the rebels is the Battle of Armageddon. I mean, that's where the rebels finally get deal with, dealt with in final number. But really, the book of Revelation from chapter 6 and on is about bringing the rebels into submission to the rule of God upon the earth. And so those are the ideas that we want to put forward. So that's the general outline. So if you're like really busy... It's nine minutes into it, and you can leave, and you say, well, I got the main point of what he was talking about. And so, but now you get the rest of the details, and we're going to also study the Scripture. So beginning in verse 2, or continuing in verse 2, we have John describing it like this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder." I'd like to first observe about all of this, and it's what kind of got me started on this general theme that I'm pursuing here, is that the, the scenes of chapters 4 and 5 are not on the earth, but rather they are in heaven. So we're looking through the open door, John is, and reporting what he saw, but he's, but he's not looking on the earth in this case. He's looking through the open door in heaven. And he is seeing uh, these things. And that is basically the idea that the rule of God on the earth does not begin on the earth. It begins in heaven. And it is projected from heaven to earth. You know, we think of, because we've made religion personal, we think of heaven as the reward that we get for a life in right relationship with God. And our ability to participate in heaven is based on that, which, of course, is all true. But what heaven really is, 
is the throne of God from which he rules over all of creation. So if you're going to think about it from my point of view or from God's point of view, from God's point of view, it's his capital, if you will. It is the place, to the extent that it is a place, uh, from which God rules. Uh, But what the book of Revelation then is, how the rule of God comes to exist not just in heaven, but how it comes to fruition over all the earth, over all the universe indeed, but uh, because with the dealing with the devil and his angels, he covers all of that. But in terms of the earth, the rule of God on the earth. You know, when Daniel had his revelation, or that when Nebuchadnezzar had his revelation, Daniel interpreted, he said there's going to be four kingdoms. And at the end of the fourth kingdom, it's going to degenerate into chaos. And the people will no longer remain united, which is the ultimate description of the world, not just America, but it is the ultimate description of the world today. The people will not remain united. It will fragment. And that's in my book, Chaos and the End of Time. Chaos that comes at the end of time is the fragmentation of the world. But in that vision that Daniel interpreted, he saw the stone cut from the mountain without human hands. And that stone came and destroyed all the four kingdoms that had gone before it, all the kingdoms of man. And it expanded until it filled the whole earth. And so that vision basically was God saying to Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interpreted, there's going to be these kingdoms, the fourth kingdom will fragment and there'll be chaos. But then my kingdom will come, it will crush all of those kingdoms and it'll fill the earth. You could say that is the description that the book of Revelation ultimately describes. It is the crushing of the, from, of the kingdoms by the stone cut from the mountain. And, and that is God's kingdom filling the entire earth. And, but it starts uh, there in heaven, and, and then it expands from there. Uh, the will of God that is done in heaven should be done on earth. And that is the message that Jesus taught us to, how he taught us to pray. He said, thy kingdom come. That is, let God's kingdom come to the earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God comes, the will of God comes, and what it is on earth is the same as it is in heaven. So we could really say it is heaven's values and rules coming to fill the entire earth. That's what I think the book of Revelation uh, gives us. And as it turns out, it is what Jesus told us we ought to pray for. We ought to pray for that kingdom to come on the earth, even as it is in heaven. And by the way, it is also what the Great Commission is all about. You know, when you hear the Great Commission, what is it? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Except that's not the whole story. It goes on to say, teaching them or teaching the nations to obey everything I have commanded you. The Great Commission is finally realized in the book of Revelation when the nations are ultimately taught to obey that everything God has commanded us. But our job here and now is in preaching the gospel is to teach the nations to obey everything God has commanded us. You know, we, by, in our American individualization of Christianity, we think of that as teach individuals to obey God, which it is. But the big picture is one of kingdoms. The big story of the world is kingdoms, not individuals. God said there's four kingdoms. The fourth kingdom fragments. The kingdom of God comes. That was his description of the rest of history uh, for those 2,800 years since that was originally given. That's the way history was going to unfold. And when you study history, you should not just study the history of democracy or the history of nations 
or even of religions or of continents, but you should study the history of the coming of the kingdom of God in its various forms. You know, I have a book in my library called Christendom. That's just the name of it, Christendom. And it's a great book because it has lots of uh, pictures in it. Uh, but it's essentially the story of Christendom. And, and by the way, what is the definition of Christendom? The definition of Christendom, you've heard the term, right? Uh, it is the rule of Christ on the earth. You know, it's the combination of Christ and kingdom. So Christendom. And we tend to think of that as Western civilization, for example, which has been Christian and it has been um, represented in the rule of Christ in various ways in nations on the earth. And Christian nations in the past have viewed God as the ruler, that God rules. Um, I, um, I showed Carrie's uh, son some of my coins tonight, but I've collected coins from the 9th through the 13th century. Uh, I have a whole series of coins minted by various emperors, but uh, all, without exception during that period of time, Every emperor of the Roman Empire minted at, le at least one series of coins that had the image of Christ on one side, and on the back side it said, Jesus Christ, King of Kings. Uh, Jesus is the King of Kings. So here's the emperor, the most powerful person in the world, who mints a coin, not with his mug on the coin, but with Jesus on the coin, uh, his face on the coin, and the statement, Jesus is the king of kings, that he, he is the one who rules. So that Roman Empire up until 1453 A.D., uh, from really from the time of Constantine until 1453, viewed themselves as, uh, as the rule of Christ on the earth through these various emperors. And the same would be true like in the British Empire. If you look at the crown that the British monarch would have, it has all you know, the gold and the crown, all of that, and the jewels and, and the gold, everything. But, but then what is on the very top of the crown of the queen or king of England? A cross, exactly. Because the cross is over all. And so they would see themselves as, um, as ruling in Christ's behalf, uh, over the earth, uh, over the land that is there within their territory. And, uh, and of course, when America became a country, the motto of our revolution was not King George is king, but it was uh, Jesus is king. We have no, no king but Jesus was actually the motto of the American Revolution. No king but Jesus. Jesus is the king of America. That was the message of the American Revolution. Jesus is King would be a great title, don't you think, for an album? Jesus is King, as it turns out, is the title of the most popular album um, in the history of America. And it's Kanye West's album that he just came out with. It's on top of all the charts. He had, uh, he's had over 200 million downstreams um, in the first like week or so of his over 200 million. But the message of Revelation, you could say, based on this idea of the throne, is that Jesus is king. And here's the story of how that's going to finally come about. The message of before the coming of the Lord is Jesus is king. I mean, that is God's message. Jesus is king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I mean, it's what's been in the hearts of Christians forever. I mean, from day one, we're a, royal, a holy priesthood, a, ro a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, the holy nation part has been was what God said to Israel back in Sinai. 
And it's what God said to, uh, to us through Peter, because he basically reiterated that same statement and applied it to Gentiles who are Christians as well, that we are a holy nation. Uh, that's what Christianity is. It is a holy nation. Revelation is the story of the throne of God being established, and so we get a chance to look into that throne. So now I have kind of was got carried away with there. Uh, but look at the, uh, just right at the top, toward the top of page two in the notes. I, I said, when you read Revelation, you should have Ezekiel and Daniel nearby. Revelation has over 400 Old Testament references, virtually one per verse. But in Daniel, there's a description of a throne in heaven. There are striking similarities between what Daniel saw and what John is seeing in this chapter. Uh, and here is uh, out of Daniel. As I looked, thrones were set, up, set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Uh, this is Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment, when the various books, the books of the righteous, the books of the wicked, uh, the book of the remembrance, all of these books are opened in heaven uh, at, the, at the judgment or at Rosh Hashanah. Verse 11, then I continued to watch. In my vision at night, according to Daniel, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, which is Jesus, of course. That's the other title for him, the Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven. Maybe the witnesses, but maybe just also just the clouds. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every... Sorry, uh, of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So when you look at the underlying phrases there, all peoples, nations, and men of every language. So every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every nation, everybody is brought into the subjection or to the rule of God. And this dominion or this kingdom is everlasting, it doesn't pass away. It's not replaced by another kingdom. It'll never be destroyed. And that is, of course, what uh, Daniel saw. But that is what Revelation sees as well. And so the throne that we see in heaven is the one where the Ancient of Days is, and the Son of Man approaches, uh, and, 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 and of this Son of Man... He is the one who receives the kingdom that will never be destroyed, and every nation worships him. So that was Daniel's characterization of what's going to happen in the end of time, when the rule of God is going to be established over all the earth. So going back here, sorry, I had that... Um, So going back to uh, the book of uh, Revelation, he said, At once I was in the Spirit, there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, Carnelian, and all like that. Uh, the 24 elders, and from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Okay, we did that. And then Daniel's vision here. And uh, then I want to continue on with the description of that throne. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God or the sevenfold spirit of God. And that goes back to the opening of the book. Um, back in chapter 1, we have to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to him, to you from him who is, and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So you have the description here of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is described as the ruler of the kings of the earth. So it's very much an earthly-related thing, but the, the, the seven 
uh, spirits before his throne. But here in Revelation 4, there are seven lamps burning, which are the seven spirits of God. So let's get a little more information about these seven lamps that are burning uh, there in heaven. Um, we have a description of that in Zechariah chapter 4 um, of what these seven fires are. In fact, let me just um, bring up this picture here uh, that taken in this chapel with that picture there in the background. Uh, but this is the menorah, and uh, the menorah is um, of the seven lamps. But what are what is the meaning of these seven lamps? So in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, so here's Zechariah speaking. Then the angel who talked with me returned and wakened me as a man is wakened from his sleep. He asked me, what, are, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with the bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, the other on the left. I asked the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me. So the discussion is, what is this seven lamp thing that I'm seeing? Zachariah says, I don't know. Tell me, what is this thing? But the answer is a strange answer. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And then these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the earth. So he's asked, what is this menorah? And the answer doesn't give a description, but it gives a function. And it said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So this is what is shown in, book, in the book of Zechariah. It is this particular thing. And of course, you know that it comes from the um, Arch of Titus in Rome, where I had that uh, menorah copied from, carved by Chuck Fountain for me. But it was really related to the tabernacle and to the stuff that was in the tabernacle. And here's a picture of the of one that looks, that is down at uh, Timna Park in the southern part of Israel down by Elot. But it's a full-scale replica of the tabernacle. And, uh, but the cutaway here inside the tabernacle itself shows the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. That's off there to the right. Then the altar of incense right in front of the curtain there. On the left-hand side is the menorah. On the right-hand side is the table of showbread. And so uh, these items are identical, if you will, to what is in heaven. Because uh, God instructed, um, well, in Hebrews chapter 8, he said, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of, of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown in the mountain. So when God gave Moses the instructions for the tabernacle and all of this stuff, he said, you need to do it exactly like I tell you, because what I'm telling you to make is a copy of what's in heaven. So you have the earthly representation of what's in heaven represented in the tabernacle and then in the temple. But um, here, John is looking into heaven through the open door, and he's seeing these same things that God showed to Moses. So I'm, I'm continuing to develop the idea that what is in heaven is a prototype for what should be on the earth. It certainly was a prototype for the tabernacle because that's what the book of Hebrews says. Uh, make everything we have telling you because it is a copy of the sanctuary, uh, which is essentially in heaven. And um, 
Jesus himself ministered in the temple, which is in heaven. That's what Hebrews chapter 9 tells us. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So Jesus takes his blood that sacrificed on the cross, and it is not an earthly sacrifice in the earthly tabernacle, but it is presented in the heavenly tabernacle before, on the mercy seat before the presence of the Ancient of Days. And he enters with his own blood, not with the blood of, a, of an inferior covenant, but into the tabernacle which is in heaven through a superior covenant. But the point that I'm making, the larger point here, is what is on the earth is meant to be a copy of what is in heaven. So it's the prototype, and the stuff that takes place on the earth is a, um, is, is a replica to the greatest extent possible of what is in heaven. But the true is in heaven, and it is intended to come to earth. So what John sees in terms of the throne, he is seeing what is intended to happen on the earth, uh, that is the rule of God on the earth. I was reading this week a little bit out of the Orthodox tradition with regard to communion. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, they were uh, quoting St. John Chrysostom. And basically they were saying about communion is that in communion we receive of the uh, body of Christ and the blood of Christ, but we are a participant with him in heaven because he presents his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, and, uh, and we become a participant. Uh, this is kind of the orthodox teaching from St. John Chrysostom. On, uh, we participate in heaven through the blood of Christ, through the body of Christ, as he enters into the temple in heaven which is, you know, typical of the Orthodox, is mystical and all of that. But it's kind of one of those, wow, I'd never heard that before in my life. And, um, and here I am, 70 years old, and I just read that for the first time. But it is interesting and something to think about. Well, so all of this uh, is a foreshadowing, if you will. Uh, of the rule of God, that's the, the throne then, which the throne is where for the monarch, the sovereign power that Jesus will receive, the sovereign or the king rules from the throne in heaven. And the book of Revelation is going to show, as we progress through it, the unfolding of the rule of God on earth, even as it is in heaven. So John sees this. Uh, and what he sees is repeated again in chapter 5. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. So you have these different words, but one reality. The golden candlestick, the Holy Spirit, the seven eyes of God, the seven spirits of God, and the seven lamps before the throne. Uh, in all of these cases, you have this representing the Holy Spirit. And if you can understand all of this, then uh, it helps you to understand a little bit about what the role of the Holy Spirit is uh, today. Uh, it's the eyes of God. It's the, uh, the, the power of God. It's all of these things. Uh, Paul said to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So the Holy Spirit goes out into all of the world and represents, it's the eyes of God, it's the power of God, that goes out into all of the world and essentially establishes the rule of God on the earth. He does so now through the preaching of the word and through the labors of God's people to 
teach the nations to obey what God has commanded. And he will do it in a much more direct way through his angels and other ways as represented in the, uh, in the book of Revelation. So that's the first idea. Uh, let me, um, where do I have this? Um, oh, yeah, okay. I'll come back to this. So, uh, well, let me, let me do it now. Um, there, so, this, so the first idea that we're kicking around is the prototype of the rule of God on the earth as represented by the throne of God in heaven. Now, the second idea that we're going to work on is the nature of heavenly worship. So we're going to read what they, how worship took place there, and uh, at which gives us a prototype for what should take place here. So here we are looking into heaven again. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So this is heavenly worship. Uh, God is being worshipped in heaven uh, with this uh, content, and the various creatures, the living creatures that are in heaven, are participants in that. And if my theory and my idea is holding true, then the prototype of how the creature, living creatures in heaven worship God gives us a clue as to how we might worship God and how the worship of God should come to the whole earth in this content. And so if you're ever run, wondering how to worship God, you could just take verse seven, and, verse 11 rather, and just read it to God. Uh, and you would be right in tune with heaven. Uh, this is the picture of the Ark of the Covenant that we have here at the church. And um, you have the cherubim there. And Isaiah 37 said, O Lord Almighty God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. So here you have God. Where does God dwell in terms of the tabernacle and the temple? He dwells between the cherubim. That is, he is surrounded by the holy angels in the Ark of the Covenant, and particularly the cherubim, not just all of the angels, but the cherubim uniquely. And they're, of course, elsewhere in the uh, tabernacle and the temple and such. And how is he described? You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. I mean, this is a true reality now, except all of the kingdoms of the earth have not yet been brought into obedience to God. But they need to be brought into obedience to God. And, uh, and by the way, if we're talking about the kingdoms of the earth, we're Christian people here, uh, and we should be doing our best to make sure that the kingdoms of this earth has God as the king. And we should measure political parties and political rulers not by their designation, but by their function. To what degree do they facilitate the rule of God in the earth? Or to what degree do they oppose the rule of God in the earth? And if you will measure political candidates by that measure, it suddenly gets very easy. You know, are the things that they're advocating have to do with the obedience to the rule of God? What they advocate about marriage? What they advocate about life? Uh, do these things pertain to the rule of God or to the rule of the devil? And anyone who advocates against the rule of God is not someone who we should support. 
Uh, we should uh, oppose those who oppose the rule of God, and we should support those who help the rule of God. Now, none of the people today are God, uh, and so we're never going to have perfection there, but you always want to ask yourself which, you know, which group is helping most toward the rule of God. And that should help you make your decision, and it shouldn't be complicated. Uh, I was pulling together some pictures. You know, the Internet is such a wonderful place. It's, uh, you know, you can find anything on the Internet today, and it's just, I just find it awesome. So I, I gathered up some pictures that I, that I went searching through how this has been represented in various ways. And here is one. You notice the 24 rulers on either side. Of course, the, the throne of God is obscured by light. But you have the four creatures, the, the, the essentially the cherubim, uh, represented you know, with the six wings and these various faces. That was one person's idea. Here's another artist. Here are the thrones there. This is a more geometrical person I can see. And, and so, um, but you have the 24 thrones and the four uh, cherubim there. You see the lamp, the menorah burning before the throne and the Ancient of Days on the throne. Here was another crack that somebody took at it. Uh, that's interesting. Um, this is... Uh, this is more a, um, a medieval or Byzantine um, representation. But here you have, um, well, you know, in churches, the cherubim usually have their faces covered. But, um, but anyway, this is, you got, you got the elders, 24 elders, you got the lightning from the throne. And, you know, that, that would be an older style. Here's one that has chapter 5 pretty well summarized, the lion and the lamb. And the seven, here they've got two representations of the seven. So you've got a double, but it's not double. But here they have it double. But still, you know, the seven lamps. This, I mean, these are artists, right? There's some, they're reading the same chapter we're reading. They said, well, you know, I'm an artist. Let me, try, let, me give my, let me give a whirl at this and see how I do. And uh, here's uh, somebody else's. And so those are just... Uh, some that I found that I didn't really ultimately like any of them, but I, I thought they were all interesting and, uh, and fun to, um, to look at on a Wednesday afternoon. So anyway, um, so we have the model for worship in what these um, uh, creatures around the throne of God, they're uh, worshiping His holiness, His power, His glory, His wisdom, His creation, um, his, um, you know, his, uh, and the, the praise of God uh, is detailed there. Now in verse 6, also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So what is to happen? What, what is happening in heaven is that God is worshipped. What is going to happen on the earth is that he is going to be worshipped. He is already being worshipped to some degree by you and I who belong to him now. We worship God, uh, and that is a regular part of, our, uh, of what we do. It's the beginning part. By the way, you know, I really think that God is 
helping us uh, in a tremendous way. I really think, for example, that Kanye West is, represents the help of God. You know, he can speak to people that I can't speak to. You know, I'm just not that into hip hop. I don't even hop. And I'm certainly not hip, you know. And so, uh, but he, but, and he is, I mean, what he is doing, in my opinion, is awesome. And by the way, I don't care that he went to what's his name church down there in Texas. Because every preacher, you know, it's not Kanye giving his benefit to the other guy. It's the other guy trying to get on Kanye's shirt tails. That's what that's all about. But, uh, and you can't blame a guy for trying. Uh, but I, what Kanye is doing, in my, I've listened to his album several times, and I really like it, to tell you the truth. It's not that hip-hop-ish, and it's even got choir in it. And you know I love choirs, but I mean, he's got himself a choir there. And actually, they're pretty good. Have you listened to his album? How many have listened to the album? One, two people have, yeah. Well, the rest of you should. You can go on YouTube and listen to it for free. Uh, but it's, um, and, if, and if you like choirs, I think you'll appreciate it because uh, it's got a little bit of that. But it's God um, giving his message. But you know, I've been um, quite struck by the fact, well, first of all, you got the Seahawks, okay? They're riding high right now. You got good old Russell Wilson, but, and, you know, a good, steady guy. But, uh, but then you got a guy like Tyler Lockett. You know, what an awesome little guy he is. You know, I mean, he's a great football player. Uh, I mean, for such a little guy, but he is clear in his testimony. And then you got this Jacob Hollister. Where did he come from? But do you know how he begins his uh, game day preparation? He said, I like to listen to worship music for a while. You know, like, have an, like a half an hour of worship music. You know, I'm getting ready to go out there and bust some heads. Nothing quite like a good bit of worship, you know, to get you started on the day. Uh, you know, but it's kind of like Revelation, isn't it? You know, they're up there, holy, 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 and pretty soon I mean, it's going to be whack-a-mole, you know, down on the earth. But so maybe, maybe Jacob Hollister is the, the, the vanguard of the cherubim, you know. Uh, but anyway, but you, you think about that for an ungodly, miserable city like Seattle is, you know, to have the blessing of guys that everybody admire, you know, uh, to be able to speak so clearly about uh, God and the things of God and just to let their light shine to the extent that they have the platform. I mean, a city that gets that message uh, is a city that God is uh, blessing with his statement, with his word. He's giving opportunity. He is declaring who he is. And his name, and I don't know if you, you just take notice of Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood is such a waste case, right? But suddenly, these various Hollywood types, like Kanye, but I mean, Kim Kardashian was in church last Sunday. Okay. I mean, think about that. I mean, how many would have said, oh, yeah, I know who's going to be in church next Sunday, Kim Kardashian. You know, but and some of these people that are big stars in Hollywood, who you'd never know, but suddenly they're speaking up and they're letting their voice be heard. Well, you know, this is nothing but the mercy of God to a, to a culture that's going to hell in a handbasket. But out of that come voices, you know, that speak for God. I mean, we not, may not be rich or famous or on TV, but we lift our voice too, you know, and I, and I love this church by the freeway. And I love that the golden cross is high above even the cell towers, you know, because and over the sports fields, uh, because Jesus is over all. And that's the message that's going out um, to the world. And that is the message of revelation, that Jesus Christ is is king. And so it's just awesome to think about the worship of God uh, that goes on in heaven, but then the worship of God that goes on uh, all over the earth. And will increasingly go on on the earth, even against a rebellious world. The world will be in full-on rebellion, and God will just start 
tightening the screws. You know, I mean, and there's always mercy mixed with judgment. There's always the opportunity. You know, the souls under the altar. Who are these? They've given their life. These are they who came out of great tribulation, out of great difficulty in the world. Come these the various ones that come. And they continue to come because God continues to show forth His mercy. I mean, the fact that a great many people remain rebellious right up to the end and they're willing to fight Jesus Christ uh, in the battle of Armageddon, I mean, it, it's not going anywhere, but that's how rebellious they are. They're going to go down fighting. They go down to hell, as it turns out. But their rebellion is so intense and, of course, we are seeing that more and more in America today. We are seeing people that are willing to go down fighting against God, and they will go down fighting. Some will be saved of those that are fighting against God today, but many will not, and they will end up in hell. But the book of Revelation describes some of the process toward the end, and I happen to think we're getting toward the end. You know, we're getting toward the time when the book of Revelation is not going to be a page out of the Bible. It's going to be a page out of, well, CNN won't cover it, uh, but they'll be the subject of it for sure. Uh, that probably was unnecessary, but it seemed like the right thing to say at the time. Okay, so two ideas so far. We've talked about the rule of Christ represented by the throne. We've talked about the worship of Christ in heaven that is coming to the that has come to the earth to some degree, but will ultimately come to the earth. And so we're seeing it as a prototype here. And then the third idea is the cherubim, these uh, living creatures that uh, who are described here, the four living creatures with six wings and all the eyes and these various faces. Now you get the impression from reading it here that there's one face. But the cherubim are four-faced. They don't have one face. They have four faces. And, uh, and they, they, they have, they're this combination of an of a ox, of an eagle, of a lion, and a man. So they're all, at least all four of those elements are represented in the cherubim. What John sees is only one per cherub, but he's seeing it from one direction. And so if you were to make a circle, I'm guessing that you would see all four. But from his vantage point, he sees one. And so they're described uh, in that way. Now, uh, I think some of you have been, known me long enough that you've heard my message, the memory of the cherubim. Can anybody tell me what that is? What is the memory of the cherubim in the world that we know of in antiquity? Yes, there you go. Thank you. It, you, you helped everybody out because they're all saying, oh, yeah, yeah I, I know that. I, I just was going to say it, and then she said it before I did. Uh, well, yeah, so these cherubs, the, the cherubim in plural, cherub singular, are amazing creatures, and they have a very long history. We meet them first at the Garden of Eden. And what do they do in the Garden of Eden? They guard the garden because within the garden is the tree of life. And when Adam and Eve are booted out, they can't come back in. And the cherubim are there with flaming swords to prevent humanity from getting back into the Garden of Eden. And so they essentially protect that garden as long as it exists up until the time of the flood. It's interesting that God wants people to be able to see the cherubim. And so he allowed them to see the cherubim at the Garden of Eden. But it made quite an impression on humanity. And so the idea of these creatures that they could see up until the time of the flood 
uh, that idea gets passed on. And so you see representations of the cherubim in all of the ancient cultures. They all have it. And in every case, they do the same thing. Every ancient culture has the cherubim. And in every ancient culture, they do the same thing. They are the guardians of what is sacred. So you always have the cherubim guarding something, uh, the gods, for example. And I'm going to show you a few examples that I I clipped out of that uh, talk on the cherubim. So here's a winged bull uh, with a human face that was found in Assyria and Babylon. Now, how does anybody come up with this creature? Uh, So what is this? It's a bull. Uh, but it has a human face. Who comes up with this kind of stuff? Uh, you have the Sphinx of the Naxians, and Sphinx means combination. So a Sphinx is a combination creature, uh, as is a griffin, and these things exist everywhere. But look at this. Here you have a human head. This is uh, from the uh, sanctuary at Delphi, and this particular one I, I'm pretty sure is at Delphi. Yes, it's in the museum at Delphi. But this sphinx, you see the wings of the eagle, the face of a man, and the body, in this case, of a lion. Uh, And so you've got the three parts there. This one, uh, I I took, because I'm I'm there in the picture, as as is Dwayne Brady. But here you've got this creature, but it has the wings. And this would go back to the time of the Nabataeans there. Uh, this one isn't, you know, only goes back to the Byzantines, but it's a winged lion from St. Mark's uh, Church in uh, Venice. But it was taken, I'm pretty sure the winged lions, as much of the stuff from there was taken out of when, the, when they sacked uh, Constantinople in 1204. They basically robbed the churches blind there and hauled a lot of that stuff back to Europe. And I think that's how that got to Venice. But anyway, it's the winged lion. There that represents, I think it's Luke. I can't remember which one. Uh, I took this picture on Crete, but here you have the griffins. You see them on either side of the throne uh, that guard the king's throne at the palace of Gnosis uh, on the island of Crete. This one I took out of a book, but it comes goes back to the Ur of the Chaldees. But you find this similar kind of Uh, combinations. They're going all the way back. That's where Abraham came from. Here's a human-headed winged lion from Nimrud in Mesopotamia, which is Neo-Assyrian, and it goes back to uh, the 1883 to 1859 B.C. But you can see that what's represented there is similar to what is described here in the book of Revelation. Uh, This is in Egypt, it's, it's one of the sphinx that's there. There's, there's uh, thousands of these sphinxes, but, uh, but, and this one is typical. Uh, and uh, here's one also. You know, so it has the face of a man, representing like a pharaoh, but the lion's body. And again, they're all of these, uh, the combination of the same kinds of creatures. Uh, have any of you ever been to uh, the Valley of the Kings in Egypt? Uh, well, you've been there, Jim. Uh, so we went to the uh, the Temple of Karnak. That's not Johnny Carson, Karnak the Magnificent, but the Temple of Karnak. And uh, when you enter this temple, you walk between this very long row of sphinxes uh, on either side. So they're guarding the temple uh, in the thing that the sphinx always does. But... So I I take these pictures, and there's many more that I could have included from all of these ancient cultures, but they all have the same kind of creature. So there would be nothing in their experience that would cause them to create this kind of creature to guard what they considered sacred other than the memory of the cherubim that God expressly said to Moses, represent these creatures in the art of the tabernacle because I want people to see them. And that would be, 
You know, that would go back to 1440 B.C. or thereabouts when God gave that to Moses, by my calculation. So it's old, but not nearly as old as some of these others. So you have God say, I want people to know about the cherubim because they guard my presence. That's what they do. That's their function. And they're here in heaven in Revelation chapter 4. We see them represented, described in this way. Same kind of creature that we are seeing here. And um, some of you have been with me when I've been in Istanbul and gone to Hagia Sophia. Any of you well, that's, this is my favorite church in the world, Hagia Sophia. I love the place. It was the, uh, and, and I'm showing it to you because if you notice in the corners of the dome, there are the cherubim represented there. That would be classic in terms of an Orthodox church. You always put the cherubim at the four corners surrounding the uh, what is holy. But uh, this was the mother church of Christianity, the central church of Christianity for more than a thousand years. You know, all of those Roman emperors who put on, you know, their coin, um, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, for a thousand years, every single Roman emperor was crowned in this church. They were all crowned here. This is where they attended church. Uh, and you can, you can go to the spot where the emperors had their space. So uh, it would be uh, on this side, you know, about over there. You look in the floor. There are, there are marble circles of different colors, which is for the king, uh, for the emperor and his, uh, you know, tribe, if you will. In the balcony, center stage, which uh, this picture is actually taken from about that spot and maybe almost exactly that spot where the empress had her spot. And so there's a green marble thing in the floor that was the space for the empress. No one else could go into that spot. But this is where they attended church. Um, and, um, and it's where St. John Chrysostom preached that I just quoted from a moment ago. But... Um, so this was the central church of Christianity, not St. Peter's in Rome, but Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. That was, this was the mother church of Christianity until the Muslims took it in 1453. Uh, and since 1453, there has been no Christian service held in this church, not one. I actually had a connection to the president of Turkey through actually a person who attended this church because she uh, babysat essentially for two of the, um, the president's kids. And so uh, I put in a request. I offered $10,000, uh, which, you know, would nothing to Turkey, but it would be a lot to me. Um, I offered $10,000 if they would let me conduct a service in this church. <laughs> that shows you what a high opinion I have of myself, uh, that I could be the one who after 500 years would be able to conduct the first church service here. And I even tried to get Northwest University, their choir, because I, I, I didn't get anywhere with that. And so then I thought, you know, I'm going to try to put together a thing whereby uh, we could approach the government of Turkey with the idea of presenting a concert of Byzantine music in its original setting, if you will, in this building. So book it entirely as a concert. And, uh, and I tried to get the university to uh, use their choir, but, you know, they just, they didn't, you know, it just seemed too weird to them. But, I mean, I would love to get a great university choir of some sort and have them practice, uh, a, huh? Yeah, original Byzantine music, because it would all be worship. It would all be worship music. And, uh, and then to go there and invite the president and all the dignitaries and, and, you know, play the national anthem of Turkey and all of that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, give them a little bit of their thing. But, you know, I mean, this is their cultural heritage as well. It would just happen to be all Christian because all Byzantine music is Christian. And it would be in Greek, but uh, nonetheless, it would be awesome, it would seem to me. But um, anyway, that'll be something for some day. But here I'm showing it to you um, because of the cherubim 
up in the upper corners. They're just below the clear story windows. Do you see them there? They kind of with one set of wings showing, but the, the two bottom wings cover the feet, the upper wings cover the face, and then the two kind of flying wings, if you will. But that's how they're typically represented in, um, in that, that time period of time. But the prototype here is that the cherubim are the guardians of the divine presence, uh, including the presence within God's people. So the reason I say I call it a paradigm, I don't know if it's actually that, but that's the way it appears to me in how the cherubim, because they could have shown him anything in heaven, but John sees this. Well, why is that significant? Because a great deal of trouble is going to come on the earth starting in chapter 6. And it is important for people to recognize that God's angels always surround the presence of God. And I want to have the presence of God inside of me to such an extent that the holy cherubim are willing to guard me. The guardian angels are willing to guard me. And I think it would be a considerable comfort to anyone who is facing anything you know, uh, that's comparable to what's in the book of Revelation to know that God is watching me. And of course, there are many promises in the scripture that God says, I will keep you in the midst of tribulation and the, the, really the promises of deliverance. And I think he does that by means of the holy angels who watch over us. And I don't know if you've ever felt like you've had an angel watching over you uh, but I personally believe I have had angels who have spared my life. And I, I'll tell you one story. You know, I'm driving across the Snohomish Valley um, in a little red pickup uh, pulling a trailer. And that was before they had the stoplight out there by the nursery. So I'm roaring along, you know what, let's say 60 miles an hour. And uh, there's a guy at the stop sign. But all of a sudden, he pulls out right in front of me. And I T-bone him. I hit him broadside going 60 miles an hour. I mean, his, uh, his teeth were all knocked loose just by the impact of it. And, and it, was, it was bad. But let me tell you this. I had left from here pulling with this pickup that belonged to the church and pulling this trailer out there. And I get down to the edge of the Snohomish Valley, and I, I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. So I've driven from here out to the Snohomish Valley, and my seatbelt wasn't on. And suddenly, I felt like I needed to put my seatbelt on. Well, I had been driving for 20 minutes and hadn't felt that. But I put my seatbelt on. I put my seatbelt on, and within a matter of seconds... I hit that vehicle going 60 miles an hour and T-boned him square. I mean, I hit him right on the door. And, you know, my injuries were extremely slight. I mean, my neck was stiff for a few days. But other than that, in fact, my dad was following me in a vehicle. And so, and he saw the whole thing happen, of course. And so I immediately jumped out of the vehicle and waved to him so he'd know I was okay. Because, I mean, you know, you see that kind of thing happen, you think those people are dead. You know, but I, I'm really here to tell you that I, I had no effects, essentially, other than a stiff muscle in my neck for a couple of days. Well, how did that happen? Exactly. I mean, that's an angelic intervention. Because if I hadn't had that seatbelt on, you know, I would, the last thing that would have gone through my mind would have been that windshield. And, uh, and, that, and it would not have been, because you hit somebody suddenly at that speed, you're going right through the windshield, you know, and it wouldn't have been a happy circumstance. But instead, just get a little bit of that, and that's all. But see, I think that was God's protecting angel over somebody who wasn't very smart. Because if you don't wear your seatbelt, you're not very smart. You're just not a smart person. There's no reason not to put it on. And every reason to say nothing of the ticket you're going to get. But just for your own safety, put it on. Well, I mean, and there's been times in my life when I feel like God has intervened. But those are guardian angels. That's what they do. And, um, and we, we pray protection. 
But you can imagine somebody going through the experience of the book of Revelation to know that God has the capability. And, and why the cherubim? You know, the lion is ferocious. The ox is strong. The eagle has the capacity to soar and therefore to escape. And the man is cunning. And so you put all of those qualities together. You have strength, fierceness, capacity to escape, and the cleverness of a human to, uh, to plot and to scheme and to do what humans do so poorly. Uh, but what humans do, put all that together in the cherubim, they have great capacity. You know, the idea that the cherub is a baby that wears a diaper is one of the stupidest things that's ever been created. Cherubs don't wear diapers. I mean, they have the ability to rip your heart out, <laughs> you know, or to, you know, to drag whatever needs to be drugged. Uh, you know, they have great power. And it's why, you know, when, uh, when I, we designed this chapel, I had the guy that did the angels for me, uh, Mark Goheen, um, I, I said to him, I said, don't, because these represent the cherubim uh, in a way, uh, because I said, don't give me angels that are diapery, you know, and so you notice that, that these angels have muscles on them, right? Uh, I mean, and so I said, that's the kind of angel I want to be looking at is one that's got some muscles because if I'm in trouble, don't send me somebody in diapers, you know, uh, send me somebody that's got some muscles. And of course, you know, notice around the, in here, you notice the lion's heads that have almost a human quality to them in each corner of the, of the frames of these pictures. Uh, those are the lion heads, but those represent the, the cherubim. But what are they doing there? You know, what's inside is what is sacred, you know, the life of Christ. And so they surround the life of Christ. And every single painting has angels in it as well uh, in various forms. Like look over there in, the, in that one with Jesus. Just look 45 degrees above his head and to the left. You know, you see the angels there. But uh, every one of these paintings has in some capacity or another, some uh, presentation or another, uh, it, they're represented. But there's over 100 angels represented here in the chapel. Well, and look at the medallions in the ceiling. That's the lion's head. And, of course, the, the ones on this side is another type, the, the arms. Uh, they have the palm branches because the book of Revelation describes the palm branches as going along with that. But the lion heads, and they're in the, you notice that they're at the points of the cross. Um, and so um, they form a cross when you look at them that way from where you look. And, but they are the, uh, they're, they're the cherubim who kind of watch over this space. Um, and it's, um, it was my version of, um, of kind of the Orthodox cathedral. I mean, my, the idea in developing the art for this chapel was to kind of be historic uh, in the kind of the history of Christianity. You know, that's why we have the Corinthian capitals, and you know, they're the most historic, uh, you know, the best historic, I would say. But anyway, it's all designed to represent um, that idea. But uh, it's to remind people of what we're surrounded by. And, of course, God said he wanted these things represented in his tabernacle. You know, the idea that, you know, we should not represent things in art, uh, you know, God really wasn't in favor. He said, don't make me in art. Don't have a graven image like me. But uh, he said, that my cherubim, oh, yeah, I want you to see them. Uh, they're pretty awesome. And so he wanted them represented uh, in art, not a graven image of God, but a um, but art in art. The angels, absolutely, God said that. Okay, let us um, stop there and see what comments or questions we have, either in house or those that are watching online. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and uh, send it in. Or if you're in the house here, anybody have a comment or question in the house? Yes, sir.
What's that? Well, um, they are an angel, but they, they are also representing the cherubim. Uh, in this case, it would be the face of a man, uh, but you could have put the face of a lion or an eagle or an ox. So you could say that's what they are. And uh, I mean, they are simply an angel, but um, the cherubim always surround. You know, I had two ideas here. One was that, and the other, of course, is the angels accompanying us to heaven, uh, which this represents. You know, we buried uh, last Saturday uh, Morris Devon. I don't know if anybody remember him, missionary to Indonesia. He passed away down in California, and uh, he's buried right over here. Um, and um, But it's nice to be buried in this place, which is where I'm going to be buried one of these days, hopefully not soon. Uh, but, um, you know, because I'm thinking about the resurrection and heaven and all of that stuff's important. To be successfully dead is the goal. Anybody else in, here in-house or... Jeff, if you'll monitor online for me, please, that would be great. Anybody else with a comment or question in-house? Yes, sir. Uh, my next Israel trip is March 26th. We're going to be there from March 26th through Palm Sunday. We're going to do the Palm Sunday walk with palm branches on Palm Sunday. You've been on that walk, and that's what we're going to do. Um, and uh, I'd love to invite anyone who is inspired to go to uh, and has the money uh, to go. It'll be awesome. And um, and then I'm also planning one for the year after that, after Easter. But the next one is March 26. Yes. Yeah. Uh, does the Bible say that the angels are more masculine than feminine? Uh, I don't know about that. I'd have to think about it. Nothing pops out of my mind uh, right now on that subject. Um, you know, is an ox more feminine or masculine? Um, is an eagle more feminine or masculine? <laughs> I don't know. You would, wouldn't call some lady an old ox, but... Um, uh, I don't I, I yeah, I'd have to think about that. I, I don't know that they're given genders. Yeah. So someone is saying in the audience that the four faces represent power, which would be true, uh, at least in my perception of it. Although, you know, in um, I was talking to Diane Medved, uh, and I was asking her, when, you know, Michael Medved's wife, and uh, she was saying that in the Jewish way of thinking about cherubim, um, it is more childlike, uh, whether that is more true or not, it, I, it doesn't make sense to me. But uh, going back to that question, uh, at the tomb of Jesus, there were two angels that were there. And how were they described? Weren't they described as men? Yeah. So I, in that case, I believe they were described as men. Yeah, the angel that visited Abraham, those were men. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Michael and Gabriel are, you saying those are masculine names, yeah. Yeah, but I'd, I'd have to do a little more study to be certain about that, yes. The question was, how do we know that the angels were guarding the Garden of Eden until the flood? Well, we know that they began there, and we don't know how long um, they were there. We do know from Jewish history, um, and like uh, Flavius Josephus, uh, you know, said Adam and Eve had 56 children, and they lived for hundreds of years. 
Uh, I forget the age of Adam uh, when he was died, but I mean, it's old. Uh, you may remember your Bible trivia on that, but, but it's a long time. And so, uh, and since they were there to certainly keep Adam and Eve and others out, so if they simply lasted for the duration of Adam and Eve, that in itself would be hundreds of years. And so uh, the Garden of Eden presumably exists until the flood when everything is destroyed. And so it's more, we know it more by logical deduction. Certainly the Bible doesn't say it lasted until the flood. But given what they were there to do, what the cherubim were there to do, and the length of time that Adam and Eve lived, it was certainly a long time and not like a two-week tour of duty. You know, uh, that, that's what makes sense to me. Anybody else with a comment or question? No? Okay, well, let's stand together then and uh, be on our way. Let's pray together. And um, I, I will send out notes to everybody that's on my list who is watching online who has requested notes. And if you um, don't have the notes and would like to get them, uh, feel free to request them by email and I'll put you on my list. And every time I do them, I'll mail them out. So uh, in the next day or two, I'll mail out chapter four to everybody. I just finished, by the way, a little tour of duty down at PL, New Harvest Assembly of God. They were without a pastor. And, uh, and so I filled in for several Sundays down there. And I've been preaching through the book of Revelation with them. And I got them up to chapter five. And so kills two birds with one stone, you see. And so anyway, so I've, uh, I've had some from watching from down there. And they just elected uh, Kerry McRoberts. I don't know if you know that name. Used to be at Kingston. But Kerry, very early in his ministry, was here at Cedar Park and taught our cults class and uh, it's Dr. Kerry McRoberts now, and he uh, teaches the cults and uh, the occult and stuff like that, But he, and teaches in Bible schools and, and colleges around. But anyway, he's the new pastor down there, and a little logging town on the road toward Raymond, and it was kind of fun to preach down there in PL. You never, I'm putting it on my resume. Interim pastor, PL, New Harvest Assembly of God. So I'm building my resume. Okay, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that teaches us to be obedient to you, that teaches us to follow the throne uh, and the, the word that comes from the throne of God. For we know that the day will come, we'll stand before that throne and be judged according to your word. And I pray, Lord, that everyone who is hearing this message tonight will determine to follow you uh, to confess their sins, to be forgiven of their sins, to be right with you. And Lord, whatever comes on this earth in the days ahead, I pray that we will be strong for you, we'll be faithful for you to you, and we will declare with all of our strength, Jesus is King. And may it be so, and may it be soon. In Jesus' name, amen.